Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss about biodiversity. This is part 3 of the video. Biodiversity means variety of life form that exists around us. It includes plants and animals. So these plants and animals keep the balance of environment intact and they are also very important commercially, socially and culturally. In this video, we are going to discuss about biodiversity conservation strategies. That means how we can protect different types of plants and animals, especially those for which population count is extremely low. In the previous videos, that means in part 1, we have already completed definition of biodiversity, India as a mega biodiverse nation and importance of biodiversity ecologically, economical, social, ethical, aesthetic along with sacred groups. In part 2 of the video, we have also completed threats related to biodiversity like habitat loss, poaching, human wildlife conflict, biological invasion and current mass extinction crisis. So in this video, we are mainly focused on biodiversity conservation strategy. That means how we can protect different types of plants and animals, those for which population count is extremely low. So for this, there are different types of methods. Second, we will also discuss few examples where actually the species have been protected by different methods. So there are schemes in the country, for example, Project Tiger, Project Elephant, Vulture Breeding Program, Project Great Indian Bustard, Crocodile Conservation Project, Silent Valley Movement, etc. So let us start with a discussion on biodiversity conservation strategy. So remember this that biodiversity require protection especially for those animals and plant for which we know that the number is quite low. So IUCN red list uh, tells us which uh, species is right now on the verge of becoming extinct and for which we have to prioritize our effort towards conservation. So method to conserve biodiversity include two main steps. First we can conserve biodiversity in the natural space. And then this method is known as in situ conservation. So in situ conservation is the method in which we protect plants and animals in their place of natural living. On the other hand, ex situ conservation is the method in which we protect plants and animals outside their natural habitat. So to give you one example, in situ conservation. Uh, so in situ conservation can be done for tigers. And we know that uh, forest is the natural space for tiger. So if we are protecting any tiger in its natural habitat, that means forest, then the method is known as in situ conservation. However, if we protect the tiger in artificial enclosure, for example zoo, then again there, there will be legal protection given to the tiger, but then the method is known as ex situ conservation. So in situ means inside habitat and ex situ means outside habitat. So when animals are protected inside their natural space of living, then method is known as in situ conservation. On the other hand, when animals are protected outside their natural space of living, maybe in artificial enclosures like zoo, gene bank, seed bank, then the method is known as ex situ conservation. Further, in situ conservation is of following type. National park, wildlife century and biosphere reserve. Ex situ conservation, that means the method in which we protect plants and animals outside their natural habitat include following main categories. So we can protect animal or plants in zoo, gene bank or seed bank. First is in situ conservation. So in situ conservation means when we protect plants and animal in their natural space of living. Further, it is of three types. First, national park. Second, wildlife century. And third is biosphere reserve. So let's see one by one all these three categories of in situ conservation. So first is national park. National park is basically a space in which we protect animal in their natural uh, living or in their natural habitat. National park are created in order to protect entire ecosystem. For example, biotic components like as we can see elephants and abiotic components for example soil, sunlight, uh, river water etc. So entire ecosystem gets protected under national park. So national park is a protected area in which legal protection is provided to ecosystem. 
including flora and fauna second uh, these national park are those protected area which have very high level of protection so nobody can hunt the species in the national park it is clear violation of the rule and if a person is caught hunting all these animals then that is punishable under law so very high level of protection exists in national park not only this nobody in the national park is allowed to collect or pollute any kind of soil nobody can damage water of the river so very high level of protection is given to entire ecosystem as per legal norms further we can say that human activities are totally prohibited in national park since we know that many a times human activities like cutting down of trees or grazing can lead to problem in the national park so such activities are totally prohibited but only tourism is allowed and that too in the peripheral region of national park in national park broadly there are two types of areas first is the core area the central part and second buffer zone which is the peripheral region so core area is the area which is restricted only for wild animal no human activity is permitted in the core area that means only wild species can move around freely in core area without any interference of human activities buffer zone is the peripheral region of national park and in this area only limited activity is allowed for example tourism so generally in the peripheral region tourists are permitted and they can sightsee different animal and by this uh, the state or the government also get revenue further these core and buffer areas are not always circular it depends on the border area and if we consider the real situation for example let's say silent valley national park so in any national park you will observe that these core and buffer area may be of any shape for example in silent valley national park core area is green marked area and buffer zone is the outer space same way in jim corbett national park core area is depicted with green color here and buffer area is the peripheral region in which limited activity like tourism is permitted and it is marked in light shade here so core and buffer area of national park can be of any shape as per the date of 2019 in india we have 101 national parks for example jim corbett national park ranthambore kana national park gir national park let's study second method of in situ conservation and this is wildlife sanctuary so wildlife sanctuaries are created especially to protect certain species for example let's say migratory birds so migratory birds tend to move from the colder region of earth for example europe and russia especially during winters so these migratory birds are unable to adapt in the extremely cold conditions and they move to our country india and in india generally we find chilka lake is one of the suitable site for the habitat of such migratory birds so wildlife sanctuaries are created in order to protect particular species which might be internationally locally or uh, regionally very important so in order to protect migratory birds in india chilka bird sanctuary was created in odisha so wildlife sanctuary is a protected area which is created to protect a particular species of local national or global importance but in the process of creating wildlife sanctuary then later on we can say that entire ecosystem is also protected all the other species which are present in that place also automatically get legal protection human activities are prohibited in core zone but in buffer zone many activities are permitted so that means uh, as compared to national park wildlife sanctuaries are comparatively less strict so in wildlife sanctuary there is a core region the central region and buffer region the outer peripheral region so core area is the area where activities are uh, restricted no human activities are permitted and this core region is only for wild animals and in buffer zone multiple activities are permitted for example activity like tourism fuel wood collection grazing etc are permitted in buffer zone so in national park only tourism was permitted in buffer zone but in wildlife sanctuary multiple activities like tourism fuel wood collection grazing etc are allowed 
As per the data of 2019, in India, 553 wildlife sanctuary are already there. For example, the Jingan wildlife sanctuary, wild ass wildlife sanctuary, Chilka bird sanctuary, etc. In the previous two types of in situ conservation, that means national park and wildlife sanctuary, mainly the focus is to protect animal, and for this we have excluded human beings. Now the next concept within in situ conservation, where we protect plants and animal in their natural space, is biosphere reserve. But but biosphere reserve is slightly different from national park and wildlife sanctuary because here in biosphere reserve we tend to give protection. Not only to plants and animals, but also think in terms of livelihood of local people. So, biosphere reserves they are internationally recognized within the framework of UNESCO Men and Biosphere Program, and then they are nominated by national government. In biosphere reserve, animals do get protection, but simultaneously local people also are provided with livelihood. They are not displaced. So, biosphere reserve has multiple zone. For example, in the center we find core zone. Outside core zone is the buffer zone. So in core zone, no human activities are allowed, and many times national park are part of core zone. In buffer zone, that means in this region of periphery, uh, tourism is permitted and many other things like education, uh, monitoring, etc., etc. goes on. Finally, in the transition zone. That means there is another zone, an extra zone, as compared to national park and wildlife sanctuary, and this zone is transition area. So in this transition area, human settlement, especially local or tribal people settlement, is permitted. So these tribal people can grow their crops, they can do any kind of activity for their livelihood. So that means biosphere reserve is the place in which animals plus tribal group they coexist. And this concept is based on sustainable use of natural resource. So tribal people generally don't harm the environment, and they use the resources of the forest very wisely. And thereby, these biosphere reserves are created in this manner. In biosphere reserve, we find at times multiple national parks. For example, let's take this biosphere reserve of South India. This reserve is Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve of South India has many national parks in it. For example, Nagarholo National Park, Bandipur National Park, and in this area we have core zone where no human activity is permitted. Then there are manipulation zones like forestry is permitted, tourism is allowed, and in case any area has been damaged, then a zone known as restoration zone is also there in order to replant the tree and make the ecosystem back. Into the natural state again. In India, there are total 18 biosphere reserves. For example, Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve in Uttarakhand, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve in South India, Ran of Kutch in Gujarat, Gulf of Manar, Great Nicobar, Sundarban. They are all biosphere reserves of our country. So let's see the difference between national park, wildlife sanctuary, and biosphere reserve. first related to protection type so we have just seen that in national park entire ecosystem that means wild wild animal along with their environment is protected in wildlife sanctuary protection is given to a particular species but then automatically all the other animals or plants will get protection biosphere reserves are created in order to protect entire ecosystem and all form of life Here in biosphere reserve, even humans are protected. No tribal people uh, is displaced while creating biosphere reserve. Second difference is based on legislation. So national park are created under Wildlife Protection Act. Same way, wildlife sanctuaries are created under Wildlife Protection Act. But biosphere reserve, they are internationally recognized. So biosphere reserves are recognized as per UNESCO Men and Biosphere Program. and this man in biosphere program itself state that human can coexist with nature we cannot we should not exclude them while we are conserving biodiversity so giving the priority to the tribal group and existence of these tribal community sustainably unesco man in biosphere program had initiated biosphere reserve so first these biosphere reserves are internationally recognized 
and then they are nominated by national government. Third point of difference is related to level of protection. So in national park, protection is extremely high. No human activity is permitted in core zone, only in buffer zone limited tourism is allowed. In wildlife century, the level of protection is little less because here in wildlife century, we know that in buffer zone, multiple activities like grazing, tourism, uh, etc. are permitted. Biosphere reserve also have very high degree of protection. In fact, biosphere reserve cover very large landscape. So the degree of protection in the core region is extremely high. Many a times national park or wildlife centuries are included in the core zone of, of biosphere reserve. Next is regulation of human activities. So activities like hunting, grazing are strictly prohibited in national park. Further, in wildlife century, only limited activities are allowed. For example, in wildlife century, people can take their livestock for grazing, private ownership is allowed, fuel wood collection is allowed. In biosphere reserve, no interference is permitted except in buffer and transition zone. So transition zone is the zone where tribal people can do some kind of cultivation or uh, any activity that can provide them with livelihood. And in buffer zone on, of biosphere reserve, tourism, etc. is permitted. Next, difference is based on boundaries. So boundaries are clearly demarcated in national park. Boundaries are not clearly defined for wildlife century. But for biosphere reserve, again, boundaries are clearly defined. Next point of difference is related to upgradation and downgradation. So since national park are extremely strict in rules and uh, regulation, so the status of national park cannot be downgraded to wildlife century. But many a times wildlife centuries can be upgraded to national park. For example, Bharatpur bird century is upgraded now to a national park. Same way Sultanpur bird century is now upgraded to a national park. So upgradation of wildlife century to national park is always possible. Biosphere reserve include national park and wildlife century. So biosphere reserve also have very high level of strictness within, especially within the core zone. So national park and wildlife century can become part of biosphere reserve. And last point is related to IUCN status. So remember all these national park, wildlife century, biosphere reserve are created as per the guideline of IUCN. And IUCN has demarcated all these protected areas. So there is a long list of IUCN protected area. There are other categories also, for example, strict natural reserve, but in India, we don't have a strict natural reserve. So according to the IUCN list, national park is category two protected area, wildlife century is category fourth protected area, and biosphere reserve are category fifth protected area. So these are the main differences between different types of in-situ conservation methods. That means national park, wildlife centuries and biosphere reserve. Let's see now ex situ conservation. So ex situ conservation is the method in which we protect plant or animal in artificial enclosure. Here again, there will be legal norms and rules which will be governing uh, the area. No animal can be hunted down or no harm can be done to the species. But the only difference is that in a, but only difference is that in ex situ conservation, we are protecting these plants and animals well outside their natural habitat. So these are artificial enclosures. So ex situ conservation is of following types. First, gene bank. So at times, there is a necessity to protect genes like DNA or RNA because Many a times uh, the species might become extinct. So if we have DNA and RNA, we can propagate the species by using their genetic material. So it is necessary to store the genetic material of a species so that in case any species become extinct, we can, be, we can uh, do some kind of revival of the species. So genetic material is stored in gene bank for future use. Second, genetic material is stored using liquid nitrogen and that too at a very low temperature to avoid any kind of damage. So since DNA, RNA are very sensitive material, 
so if these materials are stored then we also have to ensure that low temperature is maintained so this method of storing genetic material at very low temperature is known as cryopreservation and an example of gene bank is nbpgr national bureau of plant genetic resource delhi and this is the gene bank for plants so all the different types of plant variety like carrot tomato etc uh, have been preserved their genetic material is stored in nbpgr so this is gene bank second method for ex situ conservation is seed bank so at time there is a necessity to protect the seeds because if we, if suppose we have seeds of a species and if that species become extinct in future then we can easily grow the plant by using the seed so the institute which stores seed is known as seed bank so seed bank is a place where seeds are stored to preserve genetic diversity for future and in india indian agricultural research institute which is located in delhi is the place where many seeds are stored of different plant variety third ex situ method uh, of conservation is zoo so zoo is a facility in which animals are housed within enclosure they are cared and also displayed to public at times zoo also serve the purpose of breeding different plants or animal for conservation purpose and example of zoo is national zoological park delhi fourth ex situ conservation method is botanical garden botanical garden is a garden which is dedicated to collection cultivation preservation and display of wide range of plants and along with the cultivation and conservation of plants these plants are also label, labeled properly with their botanical name so botanical garden also serve the purpose of education and at the same time lot of rare type of plants are stored in botanical garden so these are the methods where we store or uh, you know protect plants or animal in artificial enclosures and thereby uh, the method is known as ex situ conservation let us learn terms which are used for species in conservation so the first term is umbrella species just like as umbrella protectors from rain same way there are few species which are known as umbrella species because they protect entire ecosystem and help in keeping balance of ecology so species which are important for maintenance of healthy ecosystem are known as umbrella species usually the top predator like tiger are considered under umbrella species for example if tiger is in the forest then the population of deer will be in check and thereby the population of grass will be also in balance so tiger is acting as an umbrella species and it is keeping the balance of environment intact so umbrella species are those which help in maintaining healthy ecosystem and these are the ones which keep the population of other species in check second term is keystone species keystone species are those which are very important for ecosystem and survival of other species are dependent on them for example elephant elephant is the keystone species and keystone species are known as the valuable species for ecosystem these species help in maintaining balance of ecosystem and if they are absent then ecosystem is bound to collapse for example elephant now elephant is very important for ecosystem it require large area to move around and therefore elephant play very important role in entire ecosystem let's understand this so if in a place there are uh, elephants then definitely elephant will move around and it will create path for other small animals to move same way elephants dig hole in earth and this also helps in retaining water in the area elephant also release their dung along with dung undigested seeds are also spread moreover dung act, act as a manure for growth of many uh, seeds and trees same way elephants help in uprooting trees and help in rejuvenation of the new trees so ecosystem is dependent on elephant and if elephant is not available in the forest then ecosystem is bound to collapse third is flagship species flagship as the name suggest the flag containing ship which is always in the front 
So flagship species are those species which are often highlighted in the front line by the government. So flagship species are those which are ecologically, culturally or emotionally significant in society. Government highlight these species in order to strengthen conservation efforts. For example, if tiger is present in forest, then automatically people will be inclined to protect the, uh, protect the space of forest because tiger is our national animal. So people are associated with tiger. Same way elephant is considered as symbol of Lord Ganesh. And if government highlight that elephant is present in a place, then obviously people will not do any harm in the forest region. Third, let us take this example of cute panda. So this species panda is extremely cute and people are emotionally connected to the species. And therefore, if panda is highlighted in any forest, then people will protect that forested space. So flagship species are those with which people feel some kind of connection and thereby government highlight these species in order to strengthen the conservation effort of forest. Fourth term is indicator species. Indicator species are those which are very sensitive to the variation in climatic parameters. So they are very sensitive to variation in climatic condition. If there is even slight change in temperature or carbon dioxide or any other parameter, they are bound to respond very quickly. So these species respond very quickly to any change in temperature or other environmental parameter. So these species indicate overall health of ecosystem. For example, frog and lichen. So frog and lichen can stay only in the place where which are totally unpolluted. If a place has even slight amount of pollution, these species either die or they just move out. So indicator species indicate overall health of ecosystem and they are very sensitive to climatic conditions. Let's understand few more things. First, reintroduction of a species. Now as per IUCN, reintroduction is an attempt to establish a species in an area which was once part of its historical range but from which that species has now been extinct. So if a particular species used to be there in a place but now it has become extinct and if we do any kind of attempt to bring that species back in the same place then this entire program is known, known as reintroduction program. Now reintroduction is very important because we are bringing the species that was locally extinct from the place. So it helps in enhancing long term survival of the species. Sometimes we establish keystone that means very important species in the ecosystem. A species from on which other organisms are also dependent upon. Third. A reintroduction program also help in maintaining and restoring natural biodiversity of the place. Fourth, in long term, uh, reintroduction program prove very crucial for the economy of the country. Fifth, reintroduction program also help in conservation awareness. So they these programs also create awareness related to protection of plants and animals. Let's take one example of reintroduction of a species. So Sariska Tiger Reserve had faced sharp decline in tiger population from 2004 to 8. That, that was because of poaching activities. The tiger is the national animal of India and it used to be present in the area of Sariska Tiger Reserve which is in Alwar district of Rajasthan. But then there was sharp decline because, because tigers have been hunted down for their skin. So poaching was very common in Alwar area and many tigers were uh, you know killed and as a result of this a tiger species became extinct locally from Sariska. So in order to revive the species of Sariska few members of tiger population were shifted from Ranthambore and introduced in Sariska. So this program is known as reintroduction of a species. So reintroduction is done when a species is locally extinct and then it is introduced in the place where it used to be there historically. Let's take another example, reintroduction of cheetah. So earlier cheetah used to be very common in India, but now cheetah is no more. So cheetah is extinct from India and right now government is planning to bring few members of African cheetah into India. So hunting of cheetah was widespread. There was loss of habitat of cheetah 
and finally unavailability of prey all these factors resulted in extinction of cheetah from india during the rule of akbar that means in medieval time period of india there were around 10000 cheetah but in the time period of british rule that means from 1799 to 1968 only only 230 cheetahs were left in the country last cheetah was recorded to be dead in 1948 so from 1948 we don't have any kind of cheetah in the country so the present reintroduction program of cheetah is related to bringing cheetah species back in india so african cheetah would be very soon introduced in india and as a result of this cheetah population in india would be uh, would increase according to the proposal few female and male cheetah that too from africa would be introduced in kuno national park of madhya pradesh so kuno national park is considered to be the most appropriate site for reintroducing cheetah because this area had enough amount of prey base so prey is required for the existence of carnivorous species and here in madhya pradesh kuno national park neel gai deer and many other herbivorous species are present on which cheetah can survive upon so benefit from reintroduction of cheetah in india are following first we will be able to maintain viable population of cheetah in india second in long term ecological balance will be maintained because introducing carnivorous species like cheetah will help in maintaining the proper uh, prey base herbivorous number and producer base of the place third in long term india would also gain economically through this entire project of reintroduction and it is believed that ecotourism activity will get boost by increasing the number of cheetah in india fourth overall biodiversity of the space will will be more by this program and fifth it will also increase conservation awareness people will be more inclined to protect cheetah and other species through this reintroduction program however there are many environmental concerns for example kuno national park in which cheetah would be introduced is also the place where already there is another species that is tiger so it is very likely that tiger may come into conflict with cheetah second concern is related to the species which which is being introduced so we are introducing african cheetah but the uh, the type of um, cheetah that used to exist in india was asiatic cheetah so african cheetah is different sub species of cheetah and therefore people are also skeptical how this uh, cheetah would be able to adapt so people are skeptical and it is uh, really interesting to see whether african cheetah would be able to adapt in indian climatic conditions or not second type of projects are known as translocation of species according to iucn translocation is deliberate and mediated movement of wild individual from one part of their range to another that means an species may not be locally extinct from the place but if we are deliberately shifting the animal from one place to another then it is known as translocation sometimes it is necessary to shift species in order to maintain population balance of ecosystem or for reducing human elephant or animal conflict to increase or reduce population sometimes species are shifted for recreational purpose or commercial purpose so this intentional movement of plant and animal from one place and releasing them into another is very important to improve survival chance of a species and to improve biodiversity of region let's take how translocation is done so kaziranga national park is one of the place where one horned rhino is very uh, frequently found so few one horned rhino from kaziranga were shifted into manas national park just to increase the population of rhinos in manas national park so species one horned rhino was not extinct from manas national park but to increase the number few members were brought from kaziranga so this deliberate shifting of animal from one place to another is known as translocation so few rhinoceros were translocated from kaziranga national park in northeast india to manas national park to increase the population of rhinos in manas national park so such kind of deliberate shifting of animal from one place to another is known as translocation so while on 
one hand reintroduction programs are done when a species is extinct and then they are brought back in translocation we sh simply shift the species from one place to another such a species may not be extinct but deliberate movement of such a species is known as translocation let's study different case studies on biodiversity conservation and the first one is project tiger scheme so tiger is the national animal of india secondly tiger is an umbrella species that means it keep the balance of producers and herbivores in check so this species is very important in 1972 stockholm conference that means world's first environment conference was held and in this conference indira gandhi attended and she was very inclined to do something in the field of environment so when indira gandhi returned back after stockholm conference of 1972 she had conducted tiger census in order to see how many tigers were, were left in the country at that time and it was really surprising to note that in 1972 the number of tiger was extremely low only 1827 tigers were present in india in 1972 So Indira Gandhi realized that our national animal is almost on the verge of becoming extinct and something immediately need to be done in order to protect the species. The main reason why tigers have been hunted down are following first hunting of tigers for their skin because the skin is very valuable in the market many kind of commodities like bags uh, or clothes are created from tiger skin. tiger have also faced sharp decline due to loss of forest cover and also many tigers have been killed due to this ongoing human tiger conflict so since the area of tiger is limited the prey base available nowadays in forest are very limited so at time tigers tend to move out from their limited forest space in search of uh, prey usually nearby villages do have livestock animal on which tigers do feed upon but this result in human tiger conflict and humans who are residing in the place may take revenge from tiger by killing that animal so hunting loss of forest cover and human tiger conflict are main reason behind uh, reduction in the population of tiger so in order to save the species indra gandhi had initiated project tiger scheme so project tiger is a tiger conservation program launched in april 1973 by government of india during prime minister indira gandhi's tenureship and the focus area of project tiger scheme are following first this scheme is focused to protect tigers by in situ conservation in situ means that tigers are protected in their natural habitat so different tiger reserves have been created in india for example ranthambore dudwa tiger reserve corbett etc all these tiger reserve have a central region which is known as core and a peripheral region which is known as buffer core area is totally prohibited from human activities and in buffer zone limited activities are permitted second focus area of project tiger scheme was to increase tiger population and with implementation of project tiger we are able to increase tiger population to a great extent initially that means in 1972 the number of tiger was 1827 but slowly and gradually we are able to increase the population of tigers and it has been reported that at present the number of tiger is around 2967 but this number is again marginal increase we need to do considerable efforts in order to control poaching because poaching is the main threat to tiger population other areas of project tiger scheme are following first use of information technology in wildlife crime prevention second project tiger scheme is also focused on addressing human wildlife conflict another area of project tiger scheme is to build capacity of frontier personnel that means forest staff is trained to deal with any kind of problems or issues related to tiger national repository of tiger is also maintained in which tigers are counted their their photographs are captured along with their ids moreover project tiger scheme is also working a lot in order to declare and consolidate new tiger reserves and to provide more in situ conservation 
for this species. So Project Tiger Scheme is one of the most successful scheme of our country to protect the species by in situ conservation method. Second case study is related to Project Elephant. Elephant is keystone species. Keystone means that it is important for entire ecosystem. If elephant is present in an ecosystem, they will create path for small animal to move around. Elephants also dig hole through their trunk and these holes are very important in, in capturing water, rainwater. Elephant also move around over a large area and along with that they release dung. Dung act as a manure for the seeds and many seeds are also spread through their dungs. Elephant also uproot the tree and helps in regeneration of the new plants. So elephant are quite important for ecology. Elephant are also culturally significant in India and we worship elephant as Lord Ganesh. Earlier elephant used to be present all across Indian subcontinent. But now the population of elephant is restricted only to few areas. Uh, at present elephant which was widely present all across Indian subcontinent is now limited to only few scattered forested regions. So the first place where elephant is present in India is the northwest range where that means Uttarakhand area. Second area in which elephants are found is northeast region like Assam, Manipur etc. Third area of elephant is the Odisha area or we can say the central region. And also elephants are present in southern India that means in the area of Kerala and Karnataka. So elephant which was widely present in Indian subcontinent is now limited only to these fragmented regions. Elephants have faced sharp decline in population because of poaching for their tusk. Elephants in large number have been killed in order to extract their tusk. Tusk is very valuable in international market and many decorative items, statues, etc. are created from their tusk. But in that process, especially male elephant which possess tusk are hunted down by poachers. Elephants have also faced sharp decline because of loss of habitat. So many animals uh, are killed because we have encroached in the forested space. The limited forest that is left now in India are also continuously being used for developmental activity like to create a railway path or to create other kinds of uh, developmental project. But in that case, elephants are killed. Human wildlife conflict has also resulted in their sharp decline. Many times elephants enter into the nearby field in search of food, but then farmers or other local pe people feel agitated and they take revenge from animal by very brutal methods. For example, sometimes uh, these local people use electrocution method and put very high voltage wire by which elephants get killed. Many a times these elephants are harmed by putting firecrackers or explosives in the field. So Project Elephant Scheme was launched by Government of India in 1992. It is centrally sponsored scheme and following are the main objective of this scheme. First, this scheme is focused on protection of elephant, their habitat and the corridors through which they move. Second, this scheme is also focused to address the issue of human wildlife conflict. Third, Another area on which this project elephant scheme is working is towards welfare of captive elephant or tamed elephants. And lastly, this scheme is also focused to promote awareness, awareness related to uh, protection of elephants. So in this scheme, elephants are being protected by creating elephant reserve. Elephant reserves are those areas where elephants are found and strict rules and regulations are created in order to protect them. At present, we have many elephant reserves like in Uttarakhand, Northeast, Odisha, South India. Now by creating elephant reserve, we have been able to increase elephant population in the country. According to the date of 2012, we have around 30,000 elephants in the country. 
there is also an ongoing scheme under project elephant to protect the elephant corridors elephant corridors are the places through which elephant move from one forested region to another let's say these green colored circle represent elephant forest reserves and elephant need area to move from one forest to another because already forests are fragmented so the path which elephant take from movement from uh, for moving from one forested territory to another is fixed and it is quite well known and can be marked by the scientist this area is known as wildlife corridor ideally we should keep wildlife corridor only for the movement of elephant so that there is no obstruction in their path but with developmental activities we have intruded in the wildlife corridor also so many a times vehicles tend to move in in the wildlife corridor so under project elephant scheme there is an ongoing focus to protect these wildlife corridors so many wildlife corridors of elephant have been identified and been given complete protection next scheme is project crocodile so crocodile is the top predator of aquatic ecosystem and if crocodile is present then fishes and other popula population of other animal would be in balance in india there are three types of crocodile first gharial second magar and third salt water crocodile gharial and magar are fresh water crocodile that means they can stay only in the water that is very less amount of salt content but these fresh water resources in india are extremely polluted moreover we have created dams on the river due to which the number of gharial and magar have declined and at present gharial is critically endangered that means there has been sharp decline in the population it is on the verge of becoming extinct same way magar is vulnerable and the population of magar has also declined in past few years salt water crocodile as the name suggest this crocodile is present near to the coastal region but damage to the coastal vegetation especially mangrove trees have resulted in their sharp decline and thereby salt water crocodile has already become extinct from tamil nadu and kerala it is only present in west bengal and odisha right now so there is a need to protect gharial magar salt water crocodile and for this reason project crocodile scheme was initiated by government of india project crocodile scheme was launched in 1975 to increase population of crocodile species this scheme was launched by government of india with support from undp that is united nations development program and food and agricultural organization this scheme was focused on following points first in situ conservation so in situ conservation of crocodile was one area that means crocodile were given protection in their natural spaces for example crocodile sanctuaries have been created in india like for example national chambal wildlife sanctuary has been created in madhya pradesh this is the natural space in which crocodiles are found and this space has been provided with legal protection nobody can harm or hunt these species in a national chambal wildlife sanctuary second method of protecting crocodile under project crocodile scheme is ex situ conservation under ex situ conservation crocodiles are protected in artificial space So 16 crocodile rehabilitation centers have been created for breeding programs. Next scheme is project vulture. So vultures are natural scavenger of ecosystem. They feed and clean the ecosystem as they feed on dead animals. So they are considered as natural cleanser. They clean ecosystem by feeding on dead animals. Diclofenac is the chemical which was injected into farm animals so that farm animals could work for long period of time in farm area. So uh, in order to make these animals work without feeling any pain diclofenac was injected in them. But when these farm animals were dead their dead body was consumed by indian vulture. It was noticed that these indian vulture had faced sharp decline 
in population because of extremely high level of diclofenac in their body. So Indian vulture is right now critically endangered species that means almost on the verge of becoming extinct. And the reason is biomagnification that means chemical diclofenac magnified in the body of a vulture through food chain. And this chemical created renal failure and it was very much neurotoxic to Indian vulture. So the number of Indian vulture is extremely low in the country and there is tremendous uh, need to protect Indian vulture. So to protect vulture, Project Vulture Scheme was initiated by Government of India in 2006. And since 2006, we have put a complete ban on the usage of diclofenac. So diclofenac was completely banned for veterinary use in India since 2006. Project Vulture Scheme also include following methods for protecting vulture. First, in-situ conservation strategy where we are protecting vulture in their natural space of living. In this, vulture safe zones have been declared in India. These vulture safe zones are habitat of vulture in which use of chemical is prohibited by the government. So let's see here, in this map, different areas like Pinjor, Central Gujarat, Saurashtra, Madhya Pradesh area, Hazari Bagh of Jharkhand, Bengal area, Majoli Island area of Assam, etc. have been declared as vulture safe zone. That means these are the natural place where vulture are found to reside and in these areas no chemical is allowed because chemical is the main threat to the vulture population. These vulture safe zone are marked based on core and buffer strategy. Core area prohibit any use of chemical. In buffer zone limited chemical use is permitted. Second way by which vultures are being protected under project vulture scheme is ex situ conservation. Ex situ conservation means artificial method in which vultures are, uh, vultures are made to multiply in order to increase their population. So vulture conservation breeding centers have been established in India for breeding vulture. So at present different ex situ conservation strategy is used in Pinjor, Haryana, Junagar, Gujarat different areas of Bhopal, Telangana, Odisha, Bengal, Assam and Rachi. So in all these places, vultures are mated to increase their population. So under project vulture scheme, both in situ and ex situ method of conservation are used to protect and increase the number of vultures in India. Next scheme is project Great Indian Bustard. So Great Indian Bustard is the state bird of Rajasthan. It is very tall bird around 3.3 feet tall and in weight it is around 18 kg. So it is a very heavy bird. Earlier this bird used to be present in many areas of uh, India but now it is restricted to only Rajasthan, Gujarat and some parts of uh, Maharashtra. So at present, the number of Great Indian Bustard is very low. It is found only in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra and also few places in Andhra and Karnataka. In 1969, the number of Great Indian Bustard was 1260. But then there was sharp decline in uh, the bird's population. At present, the number is below 150. So this Great Indian Bustard has declined because of collision with live high tension wire. In the parts of Rajasthan, Gujarat, many uh, renewable energy projects are going on. For example, wind energy projects, etc. There are transmission lines to transfer electricity from these um, renewable energy plants to other areas of uh, the state. But in between these birds, which are very heavy, they, when they fly, they are unable to trace the way and they uh, collide with live high tension wires. So the great Indian busters are very heavy bird and they have limited frontal vision. They find very difficult to change the course of flight and many times these birds get killed in the wires. Second threat to Indian buster is related to their habitat. Great Indian buster require open grassland and scrubland for survival. But construction in birds habitat is causing hindrance to the survival of this species. So in the area of Rajasthan, Jaisalmer, 
or Gujarat, we have intruded in the words habitat. Most of the places have been developed and as a result of this, this bird is unable to survive. Today the population of the bird is 200 and therefore this bird is placed in the category of critically endangered species. Right now this bird is restricted to Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka. So in order to save Great Indian Bustard, Project Great Indian Bustard was launched by Rajasthan government on 5th June 2013. In this project, First way of protecting this bird is related to in-situ conservation. So the habitat of bird is protected legally under in-situ conservation. For example, since the bird is found in the grassland or desert region of Rajasthan, therefore Desert National Park was created by government in order to save its habitat. Second, Great Indian Bustard is also focused on ex-situ conservation. Under ex situ conservation, artificial methods are used to increase population of bustard. So, central government has initiated a project which is titled as Habitat Improvement and Conservation Breeding of Great Indian Bustard and Integrated Approach. The project is financially supported with 33.85 crore rupees for 5 years and under this project, uh, Wildlife Institute of India, Rajasthan government and Union government is planning to increase the breeding projects. That means they are artificially mating Great Indian Bustard to increase the population of the species. So breeding program is being done to repopulate Great Indian Bustard. Bird eggs are incubated and second and third generation born by the breeding will then be released in the wild. So mating of bird is going on and the new progeny would be released when conditions would be suitable. At present, the breeding program is going on in Rajasthan. Within Rajasthan, two areas, Jaisalmer and Kota are the places where breeding program is going on. So Jaisalmer and Kota have a captive breeding program for Great Indian Bustard. Further, since this Great Indian Bustard gets uh, affected due to power line and transmission line. So Supreme Court has recommended all the power lines to be made underground. Also there is an ongoing project to divert the birds by having some kind of diverters. So many power lines in future would go underground in order to save Great Indian Bustard species and many diverters would also be hanged on the transmission line so that bird visibility could be increased. As a result of this, it is quite likely that in future the number of Great Indian Bustard would be more. Next case study is related to Silent Valley movement. So Silent Valley is one of the area within Kerala that is part of South India. Silent Valley is also part of Western Ghat and thereby Silent Valley is one of the area where biodiversity is very rich and this place has tropical evergreen kind of forest cover. But however in 1970s there was a proposal to create dam in Silent Valley zone. Now Silent Valley also has large number of rivers for example uh, Tutha ri river and also Bharata river. Tutha river is also known as Kunti river and the proposal of dam construction was right here on Kunti river of Silent Valley zone. As soon as this proposal was out, many scientific, many people from scientific community, especially Romulus Whittaker, who is famous uh, reptile expert of the country, had highlighted that this proposal of dam construction would result in large scale damage to the Silent Valley zone. So Silent Valley movement was initiated by people and the main focus was that this Silent Valley movement area is extremely rich in tropical evergreen forest cover and with construction of dam it is it was expected that large area of forest would be cleared up. Second Silent Valley area also has large number of species also such species are endemic to Silent Valley area that means these species are only present in Silent Valley area and nowhere else they are found. So with construction of dam in Silent Valley zone there was high chance of loss of species. For example, lion-tailed mecca is one of the endemic species of Silent Valley Zone. 
same way great hornbill is found in silent valley area further nilgiri wood pigeon is also present in silent valley uh, zone so with uh, form, with construction of dam it was quite likely that all these species which are only present in this place would get extinct third concern of environmentalists was related to bharata river so tutha river is the tributary of bharata river so the proposal of dam construction was right here on tutha river and it was expected that if kunti river or tutha river was used for dam construction then effects would be noticed in bharata river it was expected that bharata river would become very dry and farmers and other people who are dependent on the water of bharat river would face severe loss of economy with high protest by the local people and by scientific community government had declared complete ban on dam construction no dam proposal was there uh, thereby accepted and further silent valley zone was converted into national park so there is a core zone buffer zone and in both the zone a wild species are getting complete legal protection so at times local people movement are very important for safeguarding the biodiversity of the place and silent valley is one good example of how well scientific community and local people have participated in protecting wild flora and fauna of silent valley zone next example is save western ghat movement so save western ghat was the movement which was initiated in western ghat region of south india western ghat include the stretch of forest which starts from gujarat maharashtra karnataka kerala goa and also parts of tamil nadu so this area of western ghat is extremely rich in biodiversity so this place which include parts of gujarat maharashtra karnataka goa kerala tamil nadu is extremely rich in the number of plants and animals This western ghat is also declared as biodiversity hot spot that means extremely rich number of plants and animals are found here in fact there are 140 mammal species 510 bird species 260 reptile species and 180 amphibian species which are found only in western ghat region 25% of india's total biodiversity is present within western ghat and western ghat is also great source of water and fresh oxygen in south western ghat is home to countless species of endemic flora and fauna that means the species are restricted to this place of western ghat and nowhere else such species are found for example lion tailed macaw not only this western ghat is also a board for rare landscape for example shola area is present within western ghat zone Western Ghat has also been declared as UNESCO World Heritage Site. Western Ghat is also the place where river system originate in South India. So this place is ecologically extremely important. But however, Western Ghat have faced destruction due to developmental project. So in this direction, Save Western Ghat movement was initiated by the local people in 1987. and many local and regional people they have organized themselves to march along the length of western ghat in order to create awareness so this entire movement was initiated to protest against developmental activities like dam construction or power station in the area of western ghat because if we go on with developmental project in western ghat space then definitely plant animal would be severely affected in this beautiful tropical evergreen forest of western ghat region so with this we have completed all the content of chapter number 4 and in this video we have completed biodiversity conservation strategy and different case study in order to watch the content of previous um, topics like definition of biodiversity or threats to biodiversity then you can check part 1 and part 2 for which link has been provided in the description box thank you